This is Fictitious, a podcast about writing and genre storytelling presented by Nerd for a Living. I'm Adrian Buskey. In this episode, my guest is Robin Firth, author of Stephen King's The Dark Tower, A Complete Concordance, and co-writer of the Marvel Comics Dark Tower series. Robin began working as a research assistant for Stephen King in 2000, while he was creating the final three Dark Tower novels. Her extensive notes on the gunslinger's world, characters, and influences were first published as a two-volume concordance, and then later merged into a singular, comprehensive chronicle of the massively influential dark fantasy series. That paved the way to comic book adaptions at Marvel, where she's worked with acclaimed comic scribe Peter David to visualize and expand on King's mid-world adventures since 2005. The current series, The Drawing of the Three, is out now, and the previous runs are all collected in graphic novel format. Robin was also a consultant on the recent Dark Tower film, has produced another concordance for a different Stephen King book series, and is consulting for other media properties. And even though she spends quite a bit of time with Roland Deschaines and his quartet of gunslingers, Robin is now writing and releasing her own short stories and novels, as well as other comic projects. Robin and I talk about how she came to work for Stephen King and how her career has followed the beam ever since. We discuss the scholarship of modern day mythologies and how great fiction shapes our imaginations and opens up our own storytelling possibilities. Also, fair warning that this discussion contains some significant spoilers for Stephen King's Dark Tower series. <laughs> Robin, thank you so much for joining us on the Fictitious Podcast. I think the greater fandom probably knows you as being associated with the Dark Tower, with the Gunslinger, for working with Stephen King, a huge body of work with Marvel Comics now, writing the Gunslinger books for them, and also because you just happen to have that RF initials yes. that is so <laughs> significant to that world as well. Marvel is putting out the Drawing of the Three in trade right now, or at least one of the collections of that expanded story. And I, I definitely want to talk about all that stuff. But what other works do you have coming out that are like officially Robin Firth stories? Oh, yes. Well, thank you so much for having me. Yes. It's interesting because much of my work life that's kind of been out there in the world, the things that I've been publishing have very much been in the Dark Tower universe. And that continues. And uh, like you say, we're now, uh, we just actually had another drawing of the three come out, The Sailor. So that's been terrific. I'm also moving into publishing my own fiction. And this is actually something that predates my gunslinger relationship, <laughs> if, if, for a lack of a better way to put it. So actually, I've been writing seriously and writing and publishing for a few decades now, actually, because I started out as a published poet. And then I always loved fiction. And I did write some fiction, but I never sent any of it out. And I was a PhD student when I met Stephen King. And then I did all the Dark Tower stuff. And then, as I said, I'm, I'm now moving back into fiction. And I'm having a story published with fantasy and science fiction coming out July, August. What's really interesting, though, when it, it kind of, as they, as we say in Midworld, Ka is a wheel, and it <laughs> always comes back round to the place where it started. What's really interesting is I sent this story out, so it's the first official story of mine that's out in the world, nothing to do with The Gunslinger, except what's really fascinating is it is the same magazine that first published The Gunslinger. How weird <laughs> is that? So there you go. It's it's circular. But, um, you know, it feels good because, I mean, I love Midworld and I love Roland Deschain. But I also, all the stories that I've been writing for all these years, I just, I'm like, okay, time to send them out as well. As a writer, as, you know, creative people, we all have to kind of say to ourselves, okay, we are going to join the conversation in as many ways as we can. And it's always a challenge. It's always scary, but it's so important to do it. So, so thank you for <laughs> listening. That's a very long answer to your question. <laughs> it's a good one. I think it's very interesting. I talk to a lot of like screenwriters and stuff too. And it's very interesting to me to talk to people who are working creatively in somebody else's sandbox. 
when you come yes. in, whether it's, you know, when you're writing for TV and you're, you've got a showrunner or a creator who set something up and you're writing in there or authors who are taking and running, you know, completing somebody else's story or somehow expanding on. I mean, we see that now we've got a lot of legacy authors, whether it's like a Robert Jordan or like a Robert Asprin or, or you have, they, they've created these big worlds and now other people are coming in and, and extending them. Like the Bourne novels, like, you know, Ludlum's books yes. have all these people kind of going on with them. For a writer, that's got to be really exciting because you get to pick up a world that already exists that already has these amazing characters and settings and all this like lush background and there's so much you can do with it and I think it's interesting that like you probably think about it in different ways than the original author did so there's new places to take things but at the same time you want to tell your own stories you want to be known for your own stuff and you want to get your own stuff out there and so I'm really interested in the balance and how you make that work so I'm glad to hear that you do have those things coming out now that are purely you. I think the way you put it about playing in someone else's sandbox, that's so true. And it's wonderful and it's fulfilling. It's also a great responsibility when you really respect the author and you know that he or or she will see what you do. It's always like the nail biting moment of, oh, no, are they going to like it? But it is it is a really hard balance. And to tell you the truth, it's one that I'm really I feel only now just really coming to grips with. And it's a slippery, slidey thing because I find now it's like, okay, I get up in the morning and I think I'm going to grab a couple of hours to work on this ongoing story or there's a novel I'm working on and I've got to get that in. And for many years, there was so much to do with with kind of mid-world that would get shoved to the side because there were the deadlines and there were things that had to be done. And especially with comics, it's the deadlines are so tight. Super intense. Yeah. Oh, you know, and you, you just have to get your work in because the penciler needs to get his stuff in because the colorist needs to get her stuff in. And then if you're working with another writer, who's, you know, like I often work with Peter David, who's great and he's got a script. So I'm the first one who got has to get that ball rolling. Plus, I, I would do consultations. So all that was really intense. But now I'm definitely trying to make the space. And part of the comics are on hold a bit while we're moving forward with the film. So that opens up space. But I think it's also kind of opening up the space inside my own mind and saying, yes, this too needs its place because I really have to do this. I have to finish these stories and getting that story in fantasy and science fiction because it's a really respected magazine. It was really good for me because I said, yes, OK, this is something worth doing as well. You know, it's not midworld. It's a very different world, but that's OK, because as a reader, I love all different worlds and there's room for so many creative visions. So I'll do that. So so like I say, getting that space is something that you have to work hard at. I've been working with the folks who are making the Dark Tower film, and then they're talking about the Dark Tower TV series. So I've been doing some work with them, consultation work. So for me, it's mostly research. Like they'll ask me questions and I give them answers about the world because I'm so steeped in midworld mythology. But I often wonder how they get the time. <laughs> and this is a conversation that I actually want to have with them. And, and a lot of writers and comic book writers and artists, it's really hard to find the time. And I guess... It's just so important to make sure you do. There's got to be a certain like pressure valve release there. You don't go into that with any expectations of your own stuff outside of it, other than people just hoping it's good. I mean, when you're playing in Midworld, when you're working on one of the most significant fantasy science fiction stories of our time, really, and you know, as far yes. as impact and, um, oh, yes. and people knowing it, I, I imagine that when you first came on to work on the, co I mean, you were, did the Concordance and you worked with Stephen King for such a long time, but uh, you know, when you first started doing the Gunslinger Born, like with with Peter David back in the day. And then going on and, and to be the primary writer on those. I mean, you have fandom looking at you going, OK, this is one of our favorite things. Now, don't screw this up. The pressure's intense. Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you, and I, especially when I first started, I would have to like take some really deep breaths and say, OK, I just have to get something on the page. I can throw it away. I can throw it away. Just get it on the page. And I was very lucky that I, I was working and I've continued to work with really supportive editors who are very knowledgeable and very encouraging. That really helped, but it is scary. And it's one of the differences is that when you're working in someone else's world 
all the things are there, like the landscapes are there and the characters are there and you're maneuvering a landscape that's already mapped for you as opposed to when it's your own world. You've got to do the mapping, you've got to do the building, which is a different kind of intimidating. But there also always is in your mind, like no two people will walk through the same landscape exactly the same way, like you were saying. So, you know, I, of course, am not Stephen King. I could, <laughs> it would be amazing to be Stephen King for a day. I'm sitting right. I've seen it happen, actually. I've seen how he writes and it's amazing. And I can talk to you about that in a minute. But, you know, so I know I'm always very aware that when I wander through Midworld, I try as best as I can to remain true to his world and his vision. But it, of course, it will always be different. So the way I think of it is, it's a different level of the tower. You know, you have Tower Keystone, uh, which is Stephen King's Dark Tower universe. And then you have the world of the comics and the world of the film. And I think it makes it richer because it's always looking back to the original, always a homage in, in some ways. I think that's a really interesting thing that's pretty unique about this world. I mean, so much of Stephen King's work is interconnected, but I think there was a point when the, the comics first started coming out where fandom stopped and went, wait a minute, this is a little different. Gunslinger Born went back to revisit Wizard and Glass. Yes. Revisiting the, uh, the flashback of Wizard and Glass. And we started to see like, wait a minute, this feels like this is Roland's story, but there are subtle differences. And so people like the conjecture start being like, wait a minute, are we actually seeing the next pass through the tower? Are we seeing spoilers? Okay, if you're listening to this and you have not read the entire Dark Tower series, then maybe you should stop and go back and read them and finish exactly. them. Exactly. I, I, I think that's very wise. Yeah. Make sure you read that last little bit at the end of Dark Tower so you know what we're talking about. Good. Okay, so we're going to assume everybody from this point on is on board with that. So yeah, so we know at the end of, of Dark Tower that Roland ends up back through the loop again, so to speak. Yes. But when he comes out the other end, he has the horn. And so that is kind of, and I think when, when we looked at the comics, we're like, oh, wait a minute, we're, you know, we may not be seeing a retelling, we might see be seeing a different version. And now seeing the film come out, I think people have had that similar kind of feeling like, oh, I think, and I think Stephen even actually tweeted at one point that this time he has the horn, this time he'll, like, he'll raise it to his lips and blow. Yes, yes. With the image of the horn, yes. Yeah. Which, as a Dark Tower fan, I saw that tweet and got the, the goosebumps, you know. I, now, and I, I, I'm glad to hear that you're a consultant on it because I feel like, outside of Steve himself, like, you are, like, the preeminent scholar of Dark Tower. Thank you. <laughs> That's so kind. Yeah. I've lived here for a long time. <laughs> and so when you came on board, I guess we're going to backtrack a minute here, but like when you came on board, you were a research assistant initially, yes. right? Yes. And at what point were you initially brought on? Because I mean, Stephen had four enormous books. He needed to write three more. And they were so big to get into that he needed help even sort of digging into his own world. How did that work? Well, what's actually really interesting was at the time I was a graduate student at the University of Maine. I'd gone back to do an individualized PhD. I was living in Maine. Mark and I, my husband, what we really wanted to do was to, you know, be writers and live off of that. But as we all know, that's really hard to do. So we both went back to the PhD program at the University of Maine. And that was Steve King's alma mater. And my supervisor, one of my supervisors and my husband's supervisors had also been one of Stephen King's supervisors and remained his friend. So in the year after Steve's accident, you know, he was still ha he'd had lots of surgeries. He was still in a lot of pain. He was wanted to finish up on writing and he needed someone to go through the, as you can imagine, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of manuscripts he received for that. And they just couldn't handle it in the office. So he wanted to hire a grad student just to help out. So my supervisor, Bert Hatland, recommended me, which was amazing. And I did that. And then I met Steve in the office one day and he said, um, do you want some more work? I was <laughs> like, yes. I never met him before. I was completely tongue tied. But at that point, he said, oh, I'm going back to the Dark Tower novels. And all he said he needed were lists of characters and places with page references so that he could just make sure his continuities were working. And he said, yeah, I don't know if you're going to know what I mean by that. And at that time, I'd actually finished a novel, which desperately needs to be reworked. I'd written it in my 20s. And um, I was like, well, actually, I do know what you mean, because I've written this novel, and I know you could be in one place, and all of a sudden, it doesn't work. And you, you think you're speaking to character X, but actually, four chapters ago, that person died. You know yeah. what I mean? This <laughs> yeah. kind of stuff. So, and he looked at me like, oh, uh, 
maybe she knows, maybe she doesn't. But uh, So I went off with the books. He gave me all the books, the first novels, because I hadn't read them. I was a big Stephen King fan, but I didn't know Dark Tower, which I've since found out isn't so unusual. A lot of people read other Stephen King, but haven't read Dark Tower. But anyway, I was completely entranced. And what Steve didn't know is that my other secret desire was to be a folklorist, because I studied that as well as English as an undergraduate. Interesting, yeah. So here he gives me the chance to delve into this imaginary universe. And that's like giving a chocolate lover, burying them in chocolate. You know what I mean? It's just, (laughs) it's heaven. So I was like, Oh my God, I can do this. So I went completely overboard and yes, I made lists of characters and page references and I made lists of places, but I also did entries and I started to create like an encyclopedia of the world. What are the languages? What words do we know? What are the games? What is, what's the folklore? All these kinds of things. And I just, I was so excited to do this. It was just like a dream come true for someone with my interests. And I have a real mind for mythology because that's another fascination of mine. So I created this big encyclopedia for him and I bound it in black and I put a key on the front and I drew him a door that said the writer. And I was like, okay, the keys to get in the door because we all know if you're going into mid worlds, you need a key. You need a key and you need a door. So I gave him these things and I thought he's either going to think I'm a nutcase or he's going to say, fine, that's quite nice. Thank you. But he liked it. I guess he had a laugh and he said, "Okay, let's continue. As I write these books, you keep building this encyclopedia for me so that you keep me on track with who's doing what and who's dying, who's living, who's moving to a, a, another barony, keep track of my languages. We also with maps, I, I also drew a load of maps for him because in the early books, you know, the, the, the beam goes southeast, but in those early books, it occasionally went southwest, you know? So we had to straighten out those kind of things. There were a lot of logistical things. Uh, the Fetic Dogen, did you just get it mapped so that we always enter through the same door, through the same hallway, because that threw some spanners in the work because <laughs> all of a sudden directions became really fluid. And I remember at one point we were, you know, the the, the book, I think it was uh, the final book was going into, uh, it was about ready to go into production and print. And I was like, oh, no, the map is wrong. So Stephen kicks like, stop. So everything stopped and he redid his directions for the characters to go through the landscape it can be quite amazing and i forget how i got to this point because, <laughs> yeah i've just kind of gone all the way around here no but that's that's really interesting because i think a lot of times when you read beginning writers amateur writers people that are just kind of getting started something that you do find a lot is that they do kind of lose track of where their characters are at in places and as a reader that can be really frustrated when you lose that sense of place yes. i don't know where things are at the quickest way for me to abandon a book is when i can't figure out the action when i just don't don't know where anybody yes. is at any given time. And I hate to give up on something, but as a busy adult, you know, there's a point where you can only give something 100, 150 pages before you have to be like, you have yes. to bail out. Right, exactly. Yeah. So being able to map that stuff is important. But also like, you know, Midworld is huge. Yes. The scope of those stories is massive. And, you know, something I think is always funny in fandom is that fandom will know the properties better than the people who create them sometimes. So funny. I know exactly what you mean. What's really interesting about Steve King's world, there's such a span of time over in his life when it's been written, you know, so he's gone through so much. So even though those first four novels and and Little Sisters of Alluria, which is the short, long, short story or novella, depending how you want to class it, it spans such a huge time in his life. And as you said, the landscape is huge and directions are in drift. So it's a it's a world that is decaying as well. And there are so many characters and every character has a background and a history. So it's huge. But one thing about his manuscripts that are truly amazing, when he was writing those last three books and I would get the manuscripts in chunks, his prose is so clean. He really must have had that story in his head for years because it was it came out really beautifully. You know, so close to the final draft. There were things he changed, like I said, with directions, um, occasional things with characters. Uh, I'd also get wild questions, which I'll tell you about in a minute. But basically his storytelling, he's so skilled. It's amazing. To, I, I felt very privileged to see that. Someone who really knows their art. 
Well, I feel like Stephen King is a very direct writer. He has incredible command over prose, but I feel like there's really any kind of deliberate obfuscation. Like, it's like he says what he means, and it comes out clearly, and it's easy to follow, and because of that, it moves. Yes. The pace of his stories, even when there's long stretches that don't necessarily have action. I mean, look at something like Wolves of the Kala, where like, uh, and I say, am I saying that, or is it Kala or Kala? Oh, I always say, I say both. So I was the Kala. It's it's interesting because different people say things differently. Even like the names, like how people say Alan Elaine, different pronunciations of words in high speech, but you're fine. You're sounded great. <laughs> well, in Wolves of the Kala, like I feel like you, there are long stretches in there where we are really just spending time with those characters and, and in seeing a whole different corner of that world that we're exposed to for the first time. And that's a big book, but I don't feel like that book ever drags, you know, like, and I think that's a lot of that has to do with his power of characterizations, but also the movement of that speech, you know, versus like reading him with Peter Straub, where like the language, it's still, I mean, because both of them are terrific writers. And I know you you adapted The Talisman, right? For comics. Yes, a book I love. I just love The Talisman. And I think that's that's the interesting where you see Straub's influence on King's writing there, where like there's maybe a little bit more poetry in the writing, but it still has that directness to it. Yes. And it's interesting because I do think you really see the influence of the talisman on the later Dark Tower novels. Yes. Yes. On Black House, too. Yeah. 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 Oh, definitely. It's interesting how those worlds begin to uh, work together and kind of combine. And like you say, all of Stephen King's worlds they do come together and they center really around the tower, the the center of the time-space continuum. Is that a thing you had to look at in the in the research and w- both for him and then putting together Concordance where you had to dig into the other novels too and be like, okay, where, where does this touch? Where does it overlap? How do I figure out that stuff? Yes, I did. And some of it, when I was reading, I saw and I thought, okay, I need to go back to this book. I need to go back to that book. But I also asked Steve himself, I said, look, I want to make sure that I include everything that you think is most central. You know, he told me the ones that he felt were most centrally tied to Dark Tower. And that list has since grown with other things he's written. But I do see, whenever I look at things of his, I see echoes of Dark Tower and also in other programs, you know, because th- like you said, it's had such an influence. I'll watch, you know, whether it's Firefly or, oh, what was the recent television program? I can't believe I'm forgetting it. The name of it, it was with the kids. It was a little bit like Stand By Me. Stranger Things. Stranger Things, which I thought was wonderful. You do feel the influence of Stephen King. Enormously. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Which is just, it's just wonderful. Yeah. Like watching Stranger Things. I mean, in in many ways, that show is a love letter to both King's work and Steven Spielberg's like 80s work. And, um, and yes, I mean, I agree. and there are several times where you even see like, like Stephen King novels in people's hands and stuff, you know, they're pretty, they're pretty yes. overt about that influence. Oh, yes. Yeah. That taking of like the childhood innocence and combine it with really creepy otherworldly stuff is so, so distinct. I mean, not obviously not the only writer to do that, but very distinctly King and very distinctly it. Yes. Oh, yes. So at what point when you were, I mean, so you put together this, this huge volume of stuff and it's an ongoing thing. And at what point did somebody say, hey, you know what? Let's publish this. Like, let's actually put this out in the world. It's not just a tool for Stephen, but like something that people will want to see. Well, what, what's, what happened was I was building it for Stephen King and um, we were quite close to the end because he was, I think at that point, He was well into, was he well into the final novel? I can't quite remember. But one of his agents, because he had a couple different agents he worked with, one of them, Ralph Vichinanza, who did a lot of his foreign rights, who has sadly since passed away, he said to Steve, hey, it would be great for you to have some kind of guidebook for Dark Tower, some kind of book about it. A lot of writers do that now. There, There are guides to Lord of the Rings, blah, blah, blah. And Stephen King said, well, actually... One's already being written. <laughs> and he sent my email to uh, Ralph Vichinanza and Ralph contacted me and said, well, you know, Steve said that you're, you've are you been building this big I- encyclopedia. And Steve was the one that named it the Concordance. And I'd like to see some of it so we can talk about this. So I sent him what I had. At that time, I had done it as one big book. And, and he said, I really like it. But because the final books aren't out yet, let's divide it into... And 
we'll publish the first half now and the second half when the final books come out. So as you can imagine, an incredible job because I was doing the page referencing and I, I then had to break it. So I wasn't giving any spoilers for the second half and the first half. And then with the second half, I did paginations for the U S version and the UK version. And I did it both for the original 1982 version of the gunslinger and the 2003 rewrite, uh, you know, revision of the gunslinger, you know, how, how Stephen King rewrote. Yeah. So I had to bring all this in. So it was just huge. And I'd wake up at night screaming like page two, seven, five, <laughs> because <laughs> I could see why people who do indexing for a living can find it really hard. Sometimes I think, it, I think it must drive you mad because the numbers just start to swarm in your head like little insects. Well, and the books have been in print for a really long time, so there's umpteen million versions. So yeah, you're picking like here is the the canon version of it, but then oh no, canon changed because yeah, you released new versions of it. You know. Oh, that actually reminds me that I forgot to tell you. And actually, I'd forgotten until now. I must have blocked it when I did the original paginations. I had. A British version of Drawing of the Three, I had the original Gunslinger published by in the large edition. So I had all different versions. And then, of course, I had all my references were to the, to the manuscripts, Stephen King's manuscripts for the last three books. So when it came time to print, they said, OK, well, we've got to unify this. So they decided which versions of the books I was going to use. And I had to re-index. Oh, oh no. So... I have indexed that one of the reasons I think I do have this weird knowledge of Midworld. And as I say to my husband, sometimes I remember the events of Roland's life better than I remember the events of my own life, which is a very frightening thing to admit, yeah. but true. <laughs> that is because I've indexed these books page by page, word by word, character by character, so many times. Once you've done that, you know a book. You know it like you know your fingers. You know what I mean? You just you just do. When I was in school, one of my favorite literature professors was a professor of mythology, and she could recite the Odyssey, the Iliad, you know, all that stuff in three different languages. That's incredible. Yeah. yeah. And she had gone through and done stuff like that. And she had done every imaginable version that was available at the time, was just this incredible scholar of it. And she could sit in the room and be like, oh, here's, you know, from off the top of her head, it could be like, oh, I love this passage. Oh, but it sounds so much better in the Greek, you know, that kind of thing. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. And it was it was so amazing and lyrical to hear it that way. But what I thought was really interesting was that examination of something. We, we tend to think of that in the classicist sense. But when you have these modern works that now have become become so massively influential and you're doing that kind of work or have done that kind of work, you know, with a, a pop culture phenomenon that touches so many people's lives and is important to so many people and is literally decades of people's fandom and interests. And, you know, and you're in that scholarly realm on something that's considered pop culture. And I think King is interesting in that sense because he's that guy that like a JK Rowling is sort of transcended People say transcend the genre because it, I hate it when people don't think of science fiction or fantasy or genre works as literature, and it very much is. But yeah, I mean, your exploration of those things and looking at not only what the stuff, you know, stuff is there, but the themes and, and what it touches on is that kind of scholarly work. Oh, yes. Yeah, definitely. And I think that Stephen King's work is getting more and more scholarship. In fact, there's going to be a scholarly a conference just about Stephen King's work in London this fall, and I'm actually going to be participating. So it really is getting that attention now. And I think what you say is really true as well. I think that science fiction, fantasy, horror, these things are often relegated to a non, non-literary non genre. But what is genre? The oldest literature of the world deals with monsters and visions and angels and, you know, all sorts of supernatural creatures. This is how the human mind works. And, and great works of literature are concerned with this, you know, whether you're looking at William Blake or you're looking at, you know, Paradise Lost. These are the visionary journeys. And they're, you know, realistic fiction also. That's another journey. But it's such a shame when people feel they have to relegate what is worthwhile literature and what is not. And another thing that's really interesting is uh, that Stephen King does is that interweaving of different genres. Like with Dark Tower, 
it has some science fiction, it has some fantasy, and then he really is drawing on poetry, he's drawing on mythology, you know, even the name Roland that he chose has such a mythic history. Well, he's never shied away from all those influences. I mean, like you said, there's, I mean, you've got classicist influences in there, but then his work is populated with pop culture references. Exactly. So it brings it back into our world. Yeah. Like it's having something like, you know, them going into the wastelands and, you, and you're hearing Velcro fly, you know, playing in there. Yes, exactly. Yeah. It's interesting as well, because when I was a kid and I, I read my first Stephen King books, I was up in Maine staying with my grandparents and I remember, you know, I was the only person awake in the house. I was pretty young. I couldn't put the book down. It's the middle of the night. It's pitch black out. We're in Maine. You know, everything's, <laughs> it's dark. It's really dark. There's no street lamps. And all of a sudden I realized that the story I'm reading takes place a matter of miles from where I'm sitting. And boy, did I run upstairs to bed. But uh, <laughs> that was Salem's lot, you know, and, and the story of vampires and vampires have haunted me ever since, you know, just the vision of them. And I think you're right. There is a real power of bringing that imaginative world into your world, into our world, where we live, how we experience. And it blends that line. It, it blurs it between the realm of the imagination and the realm of every day. And, and personally, as someone who really thinks that the world is a much stranger place anyway than we give it credit for. It's just allowing that in a little bit more. And I think that that is a really old worldview because if you go back to any kind of mythology, any kind of folklore, even urban legends, most people in the deep, dark bits of their mind believe we live in a haunted universe in one way or another. Even if we say we don't, even if we say we're the most rational people in the world, the lights go out, we're in the dark, and what do we fear? Those things have never left us on a subconscious level, you know, whether no. it's the dark corners of your mind or the lizard brain or all the things that they talk about, they are omnipresent for us all the time. And we see that the farther people push away from logic and, and rational thinking, that it's so, it's so easy for them to fall back into it. In a modern time, yes. in an enlightened in air quotes, enlightened time. Yes, exactly. I know what you mean. You know, those things creep back all the time in, you know, yes. in such interesting ways. And whether it's in pure fascination or if it's legitimate belief, like they, they never quite leave. And I think that's, that's why fiction that delves into that is so powerful because I think it speaks as truly to the human condition as any realistic fiction does because those things are inherent in us still. Yeah, it, it's, it's bringing together the dream life and the waking life, which, like you say, the unconscious and the conscious or the, you know, those parts of it were very complicated beings. And to live or say we live just in the rational mind, I think is dangerous because great horrors are done in the name of the rational because you can justify them when you admit that actually we all have shadows. We all have you know, wonderful light things us, and we all carry around one hell of a lot of darkness. So to delve into horror, to delve into fantasy, sci-fi fiction, it's a way to look at the other parts of ourselves and the other parts of our world. You know, nothing is ever good, completely good or completely evil. Yeah, I think sometimes we can take those things and externalize them in a way that is uncomfortable, but at the same time allows us to disassociate them with the human condition a little bit and look at it from the outside. Yes, and, and hence to look at them. Yeah. Yeah. And the best stories allow us at the end to understand that we're still looking at ourselves in yeah. those darkness and those, those different shades of gray there. If you're a podcast enthusiast like I am, and I hope you are considering that you're listening to one right now, then I encourage you to check out a brand new app for podcast fans called Chorus. Chorus connects a growing community of listeners, all sharing and recommending their favorite episodes. It's a great way to discover new shows, and you can listen to them right there in the app. You can connect with other fans and with podcast creators in a digital environment totally devoted to our fantastic audio medium. Come find me there. My username is Adrian Buskey. And of course, we'd love for you to share your favorite episodes of Nerd for a Living, Animation Invasion, and Fictitious there as well. The app is available for free now for Apple iOS devices. Just search Chorus on iTunes. 
The Android app is in beta and coming soon. And you can find out more at their website, chorus.am. I want to swing back really quickly to like your work in the comics. I feel like we've talked so much about Stephen King, but you are very much a writer in your own right. But did you ever think you were going to be writing comics? Because that's a very different type of writing. I mean, writing in this in the script is. format. Now, when you started on on Gunslinger Born, you were plotting for Peter David, right? Yeah. Well, actually, what I the way we would do it would be I took the original novels and I broke it down scene by scene for the artwork that Jay Lee would do. He would do it actually in pages and panels, but I would go, I'd say, okay, scene one, I do a series of images, like we need to kind of look at this. And then I go through the scene that way. And then scene two, and, and I get it to what felt like a story length, you know, with the editor helping me say, okay, Robin, you need to squeeze that story in. And it was really great working with Jay because he said, well, Robin, actually this falls really naturally into panels and pages for me. I can easily take this and, and, and transform it into story that's visual. And I've always loved illustrated tales. I've always been really interested in comics I've always loved sequential art, and one of my biggest influences growing up was um, Ivan Bilibin, who's a Russian illustrator. It's very, very famous in Russia. My grandmother was Czech, but had a real love of Russian literature. And when I was a kid, she gave me this collection of Russian wonder tales illustrated by Ivan Bilibin, and he, he became a hero of mine because each image was like a story in itself and it would have small panels around the edges that were full of little designs of creatures and and magical things and other aspects of story. So the visual was always very much there in, in my mind. And I think we live in a world where storytelling tends to be quite visual anyway, because we think in terms of film. You know, I don't know if people in the 19th century had films going through their heads where they were reading books, but we do. You know? Yeah, it changed perception and how people imagine things in a big way. Yeah. So for me, it first of all, I don't want to minimize what a big leap it was, how much work it was, and how much I admire people who write comics um, and how much I had to learn from them. Because luckily we had over a year, I think, uh, actually almost coming on two years because we started to talk about the comics in 2005 and the first comic I don't think it stands to 2007 so there was like a year and a half or lots of room to play and so I worked with this story I knew so well and I could see it in my mind and and I was thinking in terms of images and writing and images and getting feedback from uh, the editors and you know just this this journey and then seeing how Jay Lee took those characters that I, I did summaries for them and you know he would draw them he'd, these spectacular images of these characters it was a really steep learning curve but I must say I think I'm a much better writer for having learned what I've learned and worked in comics so long and I learned you know working with Peter David was terrific as well because you know he'd get these stories he'd get the outlines he'd get the artwork and then he'd script and the art of scripting is really tough because you have very few words and you don't want to repeat what's happening in the panels. You want to add a whole new layer. That really was a learning experience too. And I learned a tremendous amount. And I think that my own background in poetry made me really appreciate the brevity and the power of, of well-scripted comics. Comics is the genre where, you know, when you talk about show, don't tell, Comics does both, but the art does the showing. And yes. so the telling, you know, the, the the actual scripting, like you said, it has to be concise. It shouldn't be redundant. It shouldn't need to explain what's happening in the moment. I think prose writers who first jump into comics want to be as wordy as they've always been. And then they really have to pull back and be like, no, I'm I'm doing the just the absolute minimum that I can to accomplish everything that I need to on the page. Yes, and it's a question of cutting and bravely cutting. <laughs> but to, to get down to something very powerful, a real essence, which is something. And I'm a big fan of Sandman. Yes. You know, Neil Gaiman's Sandman. Oh, very well. And I just, yeah, they, I just, they were inspiring as well because I, I felt like those were comics that really aspired to the highest levels of art. 
I, I just thought they were amazing. And, and you know, you look at someone like Alan Moore, you know, these people who are novelists and storytellers and comic book writers, they're juggling many worlds as they start to do their storytelling. So I found a lot of inspiration in these kinds of people and thinking, wow, to do justice to this story, I'm really going to have to work hard. <laughs> you know, I guess in the end, you just have to give it your best shot. And it's that balance. I was thinking about this, about, you know, nerd for a living. And what advice would I give to somebody who wants to tread this path? And I was thinking there are two things that are equally difficult. One is to give yourself the space to create and to encourage yourself and don't allow yourself to be knocked back and, and lay flat just to keep your own confidence up. But at the same time, keep your standards high. Yes. Because if you don't keep your standards high in the end, you're letting yourself down and you're letting readers down, or maybe you won't even have anybody read anything, you know, you know, those are two such difficult things to bring together because you can, in keeping standards high, you can feel so unworthy and you can give up. Or you can think, okay, I wrote it, it's fine. Maybe it isn't, maybe it isn't, you know what I mean? How do you get that balance? And to trust your yourself, the inner critic, but also to hear what other people are saying to you when they're giving you feedback. And some of that feedback, you're going to say, well, I disagree because I'm actually aiming for something here artistically. And that's okay. And maybe you'll understand, maybe I just didn't get it across. So I'll keep trying. Or or maybe it just needs to sit and, and eventually you'll get it. Or well, actually, this person is correct, and I need to go back and rethink these sections. That's really, it's hard, and it's always a juggle, but it's worth it. It's better to try for greatness and fail and learn than to aim for mediocrity and and make it. <laughs> I agree. I really agree. And I think also, you know, you see when you talk to people who are studying creative writing, and this is something that Stephen King has said many times, and I agree completely because it's for me the the basis of being a writer. To be a writer, you have to write a lot, but you also have to read a lot. The whole history of literature is out there, and it's a conversation that's going on between you and all the people who wrote in the past and the people to write it, that will write in the future, as well as people writing now. It's this great and wonderful conversation. And so it's so important to take part and to, to listen to others as well, because you learn so much from other writers. I feel like there's it's never something quite as disappointing as hearing a writer say, oh, I didn't really read, or somebody who writes for TV saying, I don't really watch a lot of TV, I just write it, because there's always so much more to absorb. Or the occasionally you'll meet the writer who is happy to be kind of pent up in their own little world. They're like, I've experienced enough life, and now I can just sit in a room and, and crank this stuff out. All of that stimulus is so important, because otherwise you just end up repeating either yourself... Yeah you encounter those writers that tell that write the same story over and over again and they might do yeah. it very competently but they're telling yeah, the same yeah. story again and again yeah yeah you know and that's when you can see where like okay you got you needed to get out and find something new to stimulate that writer brain because it really is the same beats again yeah and and like you say you know that stimulation it comes from the outside world it comes from the history of books it comes from folklore it comes from all sorts of places it's amazing it, i was thinking about that when i was a kid i loved hans christian anderson there was a story where someone wanted to be a writer but he couldn't find a story anywhere and all the little objects in his room were trying to talk to him to tell them their story but he couldn't hear them Sometimes I feel like, gosh, I can't hear the stories. But other times you feel like, you know, when you're feeling in a more inspired frame of mind, everything and everyone does have their story. It's quite amazing. What a rich universe we live in. Some of the most interesting writers are the ones that unlock that part of our brain and make us want to tell stories. Yes. Whether it's the people who immediately want to, they're like, oh, gosh, I love this world so much I want to play in the playground, whether it's fan fiction or, or something along those lines. Or for me, like Neil Gaiman is that writer. I read yes. a novel from him and all I want to do is write afterwards because I feel like he's one of those guys that if there's a dam in my head and it's plugged up, I read his work and it pulls that plug. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. It's part of why... On top of the brilliant prose and, and the wonderful stories, it's like he unlocks that world. And we were talking about like the, the joys of fantasy and exploration and story like that. I think those best ones are the ones that prod that part inside of our brain and say, hey, wait, there's more. There's more and you just have to look. 
Yes. Oh, exactly. And one of the things I, I actually love about Gaiman, there was actually, I just read the, um, let me find it here, The Ocean at the End of the Lane. Oh my gosh, yes, yes. And I just thought that was beautiful. I just thought it was a beautiful work. And one of the, the things I love about his imagination is it's playful and it's profound. And I love that combination. So as a writer, I think that kind of thing is something to strive for. Yeah, and he has that economy of prose. It never feels, especially in works like Ocean at the End of the Lane or The Graveyard Book, where it feels like he hasn't wasted a word anywhere in it. Yes. If you go back yes. and look at like Smoke and Mirrors, like one of his first short story collections, which was so good in its time, but if you've read everything that he's written since and then go revisit it, it feels clunky. Actually, it's interesting. I've read that book and I, I thought the same thing. You know, you see how people grow. There were wonderful stories in it, but then you see how a person grows. Are you an Ursula Le Guin fan? I read Le Guin uh, a little bit when I was a teenager, but have not gotten back around, which I know is an enormous hole in my uh, fantasy vocabulary, but it just means I have a whole bunch to discover. Exactly. There are so many writers that are wonderful, because I actually have been rereading a lot of Ursula Le Guin lately, and, and I also feel the same way about her that there's tremendous poetry there. I love that. I just love when these things are paired. And I think that uh, really powerful writers who deal in that imaginative realm, they're dealing with the profundities of the world we live in, but also dealing with that magical world we also live in. I'm so pleased that you're also a, a you know a gaming fan and you love these things because it's funny that term nerd even you think about what is a nerd and i remember at one point when nerds started to come cool it become like a cool world. i was like wow <laughs> wow it was never cool i had to like just be my nerd by myself <laughs> you know because when i was a kid i really didn't know anyone else who was reading fantasy and science fiction those things it was like a world i just couldn't share with anyone when you were growing up did you have a lot of people you knew who were reading fantasy and science fiction and when I was uh, like a grade school and middle school kid, no, I got into fantasy because my mom went to a yard sale and found a bunch of books that had cool covers that she thought were interesting that she got for a dime a piece and brought me home this giant pile of fantasy. And so I dived into a lot of this stuff. Fantastic. But when I got into high school, I met this legion of people who shared interests. And so we were constantly, I mean, they introduced me to like D&D &D and I had just gotten into like comics oh, then. And, and so we were sharing stuff back and forth. It was always interesting to have somebody come over over and say like oh no you need to read this so like a girl i dated that's to, to be like in all fairness you were talking about like uh earlier about how like, some people read a lot of stephen king but not the dark tower yeah i'm the opposite right, right. i had not found his work super accessible to me as a teenager i knew people who were obsessed with it and some of the really big notable pieces and for me those were there was a little impenetrable to me at the time and then i ha i dated a girl and she gave me the gunslinger and it was like something that she was really obsessed with and this was before Wizard and Glass came out. So I got really lucky that I I started reading The Gunslinger maybe mere months before Wizard and Glass. So I didn't have that seven year wait. Wow. I got to like get it right in order. But then I was like, oh, this is what speaks to me. This is the this is the king that, that hits all the buttons yes. for me. I love that combination of dark fantasy and horror elements and science fiction and and that expansive world and that playground was one of those things that made my brain just take off running with it. And then from there, I've gone out and explored. Although admittedly, like some of my favorite works from him are more stuff like Joyland, which I just absolutely love. Yes. Yeah. yeah. You know, some of the bigger ones like Insomnia have eluded me, but, but then Talisman and Black House, I think are brilliant. Yeah. yeah, I do too. But I think that's what's great when you have somebody who creates such an enormous volume of work is that there's so many entry points. Yeah. Yes. And so when you have that much work, it's, it's, it, I think it's, some people have, like, when they talk about nerddom of the obsession or, like, when I'm a true fan of something, you have to be this expansive, I love absolutely everything. That's when you get into that obsessive nerd thing that's a little problematic. But for me, I think that, you know, being a nerd means that you're obsessive about the details and that you really throw yourself into the enjoyment of something. I want to take a minute to tell you about another of our shows, the Nerd for a Living podcast. Nerd for a Living explores the lives and careers of people working in pop culture and genre entertainment, and the often winding path that's taken them to where they are now. We talk with actors, directors, producers, choreographers, writers, and beyond, and we have a big archive of interviews across a wide variety of genre entertainment industries, so there's really something for everyone. Check out nerdforaliving.com for all of our episodes, and subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, TuneIn, Stitcher, or wherever you enjoy your podcasts. 
So I, the last thing that I want to touch on then, I want to know like how you're spending your days with projects and stuff now. And then basically just a little bit of your feelings about the upcoming film. I'm sure you can talk very little about it, but like, you know, just the, the seeing something that you've worked on for so long now finally hitting the big screen and, and how you feel about those things. I'll tell you how I feel about the film first. I am very excited about it. I have done some research for the folks who are doing it, for the director, Nick Garcel, who I have tremendous respect for, as well as, you know, various other people that have been involved that, you know, whether it's about costuming or about set questions. So I'm really excited to see how this all pans out. And what I'm doing now, um, like I said, I'm really trying to make room for my own work, which is something I put on the back burner so much of my life. But also I'm doing some work for the film. I'm, you know, in ter- actually not so much now for the director because everything, you know, is finished, but there's talk about the TV series. So I've been in correspondence with the TV folks. Also some work for Sony because of doing, you know, PR stuff for that. Um, I just finished another concordance for uh, Stephen King's Bill Hodges trilogy, you know, um, Mr. Mercedes and End of Watch is the last one. So there are three books. I did a concordance for that. And you will be hearing more about those books and those characters from Steve. I will say no more (laughs) because there's more stuff with him. Yeah. So, oh, and I've done a story for Femme Magnifique, a short graphic fiction. I don't know if you've heard about that. Shelley Bond, uh, who yes. was a senior editor at Vertigo for ages. Yeah. Oh, that's so great. Shelley is amazing. She is wonderful. I did an interview with Karen Berger not too long ago. Oh, wow. Yeah. Tremendous respect for her, too. Oh, God. She's she's incredible. It's like one of the thrills of my being able to do what I do as a podcaster was to talk to her. And, uh, and Shelley's somebody I would love to speak to at some point because, again, she was so involved with vertigo and and it's an amazing editor yeah no she's wonderful and and she's put together this book femme magnifique about really influential women and there's writers and artists and all sorts of both men and women who are talking about women who have really influenced them and it's in part a reaction to the times we live in things are changing yeah (laughs) and not for the better yeah so i i was really pleased and and the person that i ended up doing the woman who really influenced me was ursula Le Guin. (laughs) so (laughs) as you could tell one of the reasons I was actually rereading her a lot anyway and then I went back and reread it up I paired up with a really wonderful artist Devaki Niyogi who's she's from India she's from I forget which city she lives in but she's a fantastic comic book artist and she's she's done a lot of really interesting stuff and Shelley introduced us so we're working together which is great so I've been doing that and I said working on fiction and another version of the concordance is going to be coming out with um, actually the British publisher, Hotter and Stoughton. They're going to bring it out for the film, which is great, with little a cover that reflects the film, which I'm really excited about. Yeah, so it's funny because uh, it feels like every day is a real juggle. <laughs> you know, <laughs> get up in the morning, okay, I've got this egg, that egg, and that egg, and I have to juggle them. But I guess, like, you know, for you too, when you're a freelancer, This is what you do. You know, you juggle all the different jobs, but I feel really lucky to do what I'm doing because I'm happy doing what I'm doing. And I've done other jobs, like in the past, I did a lot of things. I I taught school for a while, which is a very admirable thing to do and a very good thing to do. But I'd rather be writing, (laughs) you know, (laughs) let's face it, I'd rather be writing. It's it's good. It's it feel very lucky to be doing what I'm doing. Your career path is really interesting because I think it's so different than most people. You've gotten to play in a playground that is beloved the world over. And I mean, that is exciting. The comics are awesome. Oh, I've been very lucky. And comics have been wonderful to do. And thank you for your kind words about them. That means a lot to me. Where should people keep up with your work now? Because it sounds like you've got a lot of irons in the fire and a lot of interesting stuff coming. So what's the easiest way for people to stay up to date on what, you're, what you've got coming out? Actually, one of the things I've been doing is getting a website together. There's a, there's a fellow who actually was my neighbor for a long time. He was also a web designer. He's getting helped me get this website together. So I'm on Twitter and I'm on Facebook, um, Robin Firth. And the website, I will be making an announcement hopefully within the next month. And it will be online with all the news. 
plus some fun things about other things going on in the world, like movies, Dark Tower movies. Well, we look forward to uh, to hearing more about that, seeing where you're going with it. Robin, this has been awesome. This has been a great chat. I love talking with you. Oh, it's been wonderful. Really enjoyed it. It's been a lot of fun. So I'll have to do it again sometime. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, when you get the uh, the next wave of stuff out, we'll need to talk again. Very last thing I wanted to ask you about, and I like much like uh, the cause of wheel and going right back to what we said at the beginning, with those initials, those that RF, at what point in the conversation with Stephen did one of you make that connection? He's never actually officially mentioned it. But I under, I sometimes wonder if that's why I got the job, because Bert Hatland said, oh, there's this young woman who you could hire. Her name's Robin Firth. And, and uh, I'm sure Stephen said, what? <laughs> but actually, a humorous story about that. There are some fans that don't believe I'm real. Some Stephen King fans. <laughs> They seriously do not believe I exist. And I'm like, no, I exist. Whenever I see comments about that, I'm like, no, no, I do exist. Don't say I don't exist too much because what if it happens and I go poof? Oh, no. And I don't exist anymore. But um, this this is one of those very weird things I admit. (laughs) And people think I'm not telling the truth, but I am. What's really fascinating is before I, I met Stephen King and I got the job working for him, I was having the weirdest dreams about towers and it's something like out of a out of a book but i it's almost like the dream life of the world and and these books they kind of seep into your brain you know ahead of time you know so it makes me think about time slips and things like that but um one of the weirdest things was um we were living in a trailer in maine my husband and i and i was working on stories and I would work sometimes in the living room and there was a door to my, to the writing room, which we shared. And it was like being haunted for ages. There was someone, it was a man and he was pacing at that door. It freaked me out because Mark would be gone and I'd be by myself and I'd be like, is there someone there? No, there's no one there. No one there. Is there a ghost in this house? I said to Mark, finally, I think it's a character that's trying to get in that door, but he's not my character. And then I remember the day, it was creepy, but I'm, oh I'm telling you the yeah. truth. And this is one of those weird moments where don't tell too many people because maybe they'll come with a jacket and stick me in a rubber room, but I swear it's true. <laughs> I do remember the moment when all of a sudden I, it was like a sigh and I thought he's come through. Somehow he's come through. And, and not long after that, I met Stephen King. So the beginning of my involvement with the whole Dark Tower, it was almost uncanny. You know, it was it was weird and weirder than anything I'd ever experienced. And maybe because books like that do have such a force in the world and in people's imagination. And it's been a huge part of my imagination. And no matter what I write, Dark Tower will always be there somewhere because I've lived in that world for so long. The best stories bleed into the human unconsciousness i think they become part of all of our stories and and it sounds like roland was knocking at your door a little ahead of schedule yeah he was (laughs) maybe that or i i don't know (laughs) i it sounds like i was doing drugs and i was not (laughs) but yeah so it's it's weird isn't it time slips that's very much like the dark tower universe so when eddie dean started to have someone in his mind when i got to that point in the books I thought, boy, I can identify Eddie. You know, it's very Roland. Yeah, when you think about <laughs> You're it, like, it's I know very that Roland, feeling. isn't it? He's yeah. at a doorway, and I thought about that later. It's almost like a pre-echo. He was at my door, too. Cause a little ineffable. We, we see the work of that yeah. kind of kismet in, in real life all the time. And um, it sounds like that the wheel definitely, you know, turned and touched your life in a, in a big way. It so. did, yeah. And boy, I feel very lucky that it did. Life is, is much more interesting and and magical for it so thank you roland (laughs) robin this has been great thank you so much we're going to send everybody to to follow your stuff i look forward to following your career and where it goes next and reading the stories that are are intrinsically robin first stories as it goes along and uh yeah this has been so great thank you so much it's been wonderful thank you for taking the time and boy we spent a lot of time chatting so thank you everyone for listening I hope you enjoyed this episode of Fictitious with Robin Firth. The home for Fictitious and all of the Nerd for a Living family of podcasts is nerdforaliving.com. Go there for our full archive of episodes. Fictitious is on Twitter as at FictitiousPod, which is a great way to keep up with updates from the show, plus genre writery news and discussions. And you can also find me there as at Adrian Buskey. Subscribe to Fictitious on Apple Podcasts or Google Play. 
If you've enjoyed the show, please spend a couple of minutes to leave us a review on your podcast platform of choice. This podcast is produced by Wendy Buskey with sound design by me, Adrian Buskey. Fictitious and the Nerd for a Living family of podcasts for the Ambitious Geek are a production of Armadian Media and Entertainment. Long days and pleasant nights, author friends. Now get back to writing. <laughs>